Believe it or not, this used to be my car, and I made it. I mean, if you're mad about cars, you know, a Maserati is a very important car in, in the history of cars. And because I could never afford to buy the real thing, so I thought, well, I'm going to make one, just like my Hall and Scott. So anyway, what happened was, I was looking at the exchange of art one day, so it tells you how long ago it was, and uh, there was this Maserati advertiser that had obviously had a monster crash. And, um, and I thought, oh, I'll go and have a look at that. So anyway, I went and had a look at it, and I bought it. And um, bought it home to Greenford, Middlesex, where I was, I was still living in my house at the time, and I had a shed at the bottom of the garden. So this is where it all started. And obviously, you'll see the pictures later on. So anyway, I, I bought the car, took the body off, started work on it, did a little bit of welding, shortened the chassis, and by then I was having trouble with the council, I was getting a load of work, and you know, you just couldn't do it in a normal house. I had Ferraris on the lawn and Bugattis and all, you know. So anyway, we had to get a premises. So off I go down to Derby Road, which is just down the road, and there was loads of factories, and they took me into a new factory. I walked in, and there's nothing, it's just walls. No lights, nothing. I thought, well, I couldn't even afford to buy the lights. They might have anything else. But anyway, as we were driving out, I saw this big sign up, lease for sale. So anyway, I went and had a look, and it was a firm that did false teeth. And they put a mezzanine floor in, there were offices and rooms, and oh, they spent a fortune. Anyway, I thought, well, if I could get permission and everything, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to buy the lease. So anyway, I bought the lease, and all we had to do was take stuff out. We took various walls out and and um, all the wiring was there and it was it was pretty easy to turn it into a car shop. So that's what we did. Usual story, buying a lease, moving premises, I needed some money. So one day Bill came to see me and I said, Oh, I need some money, Bill. What what's up then? I went, Oh well I'm changing the premises and blah blah blah. So he said, well, what about me buying a Maserati project? At that stage, it was just a load of bits and pieces, really. But anyway, so he bought it off me. And over the next 15 years, he was so patient and what have you, and you'll see all the photographs. But anyway, old Bill just kept paying the bill for having the various work done, and, and it was a very useful thing to do. And that is the story behind this car. But anyway... He rang me up recently, I went up to London, and he said it's the first time for 10 years, he said, it's given any trouble, and it won't start, and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, we went round to his garage in Belgravia and tried to start it, and I fiddled about with the plug leads, and it started. So I'm convinced that the original plug leads, which go back to 1957, are not surprisingly shorted out. So I've ordered some new plug lead from, on eBay, because it's much smaller, it's five mil or something, instead of the normal thickness that we're using in England. But anyway, so when we get that, we're going to put the plug leads on, and then I'll take that road in it. I mean, it would be a really good, it's a good old thing, it really does go, but it drives very, very nicely. This gear lever falls to hand, and I'm surprised it does really, but then what happened was, we put it together and the gear lever was over the other side of the car. You know, in other words, it was a left-hand drive car. I converted it to right-hand drive. So, as it happened, the holes in the gearbox bell housing were symmetrical. So all I had to do was turn it around one set of holes and it put the gear lever in the most perfect place you could probably have a gear lever. So that's the story there. But, um, we took, we took loads of pictures when we were doing it. And we've managed to sort them out because it finished up. We started it in Long Drive. We then went to Derby Road and it got finished here in Ickford when we bought the farm. So that's a good number of years. We've been in the farm for 32 years and I would say probably for the first five or ten years in the farm we finished it off. But old Bill was very patient but then again, he was dead clever because he's turned out to be a lovely little car and he drives it around London and he has a lovely time in it. In fact, when we drove it back for London, you'd have thought we was 
film stars going along, you know. It was like people taking photographs and leaning out of taxis and putting thumbs up and, you know, it just causes a sensation wherever you go. Because if this was the real 3000S, it would be probably worth five or ten million quid. In actual fact, I worked on a real 3500S. It was the x car that came from America. And it was owned by a German customer of ours called... Um, oh, can't remember. And uh, anyway, it was such a lovely original car. And I remember all the wheels had spears stamped on them. And, um, you know, it was just a lovely, lovely original car. Um, but by then, we were well on with this. But I must say, there was a few little bits on the original car that we looked at and thought, oh, that looks good. We'll have to copy that. And so we did. So that helped a little bit. But what a good old car, you know. And I can't wait to drive out the road. We get the plug leads, we get them on, and then we'll take you for a test drive in it. The first picture shows the crashed car that I bought out of the Exchange of Mark. And we took the remains of the body off it, and that was on the lawn in Greenford, Middlesex. And the next picture shows me looking at it all and deciding how we're going to do it. But anyway, that was the absolute start. And the next picture is a rough sort of frame that I made up to hold the chassis square, because we had to shorten the chassis. Oh, I can't remember the exact measurement, but it was two or three feet. Um, and the very funny thing about the chassis was that although the car was a road car, it was a 3,500 GT or something like that, when we took it absolutely to pieces, the actual original chassis rails were narrower on one side than the other. And if you look at the picture where I'm welding it, you can see one side's fatter than the other. And the thinner side is for the exhaust to come down. Well, of course, it never came down on the 3500, so why that was there, I don't know. But it suited us beautifully, because that was where we were going to run the exhaust. The next picture just shows where I've welded it up. And, uh, and then you can start to see the fabrication. We obviously made the tunnel um, and the shot was all the mountains I used it. And the thing is that the original car had Jaguar suspension. It had a Salisbury back axle and Jaguar front suspension, the original car from Maserati. So it was quite easy for me to convert it from right-hand drive to left, no, left-hand drive to right-hand drive. And the rear shockers, I just copied a Capri, because by then I'd actually raced a Capri, and I knew about putting one shocker absorber in front of the axle, and one shocker absorber behind the axle to stop the thing twisting up. And I also used single-leaf, three-litre Capri springs. But most of the actual fabrication and everything was done by a bloke called Steve White who came, he was a mate of Neil Davis's, and he came one day and he was moaning about he got a job and he said on Sunday nights, he said, I'm almost suicidal. So I said, well, why don't you come work with us and we'll teach you how to MIG weld and what have you. So we taught him how to MIG weld and he just learned as he did it, really. It was quite funny, really. When we were doing the tunnel over the prop shaft, he said, how am I going to bend that bit of metal? I said, oh, I don't know, let's get her an oxygen bowl. So we just got an oxygen bottle and we bent this piece of metal round and old Steve welded it all in and by the end of it he could rig well beautifully. Um, and of course this went over years and years because, you know, first of all it started off in Greenford, then it went to our new premises we had, which is why I sold the car in the first place, and, uh, and then it finished up at the farm. And Timothy by now had grown up and he, was, he worked on it as well. But anyway, so there's another picture of the nose cone. But by then we got well on with this. But there was a few little touches, you know, that we could look at the original car and think, oh, that's nice, we'll do that. So, so that was that. And this picture you've got up now is of the uh, car in the new premises. And that's a picture of us mounting the shock absorber off the chassis. We didn't buy new shock absorbers, so a couple of old shock absorbers I had, and we made it accordingly. This picture is of painting it and getting it ready to then start having the body fitted. So that's just really to stop it going rusty.
So that's the car with half the body made. Some blokes that sell stoked in the body, a couple of good old boys who worked in the aircraft industry during the war. Obviously, that's where they learned their trade and they were very good at it. And of course, you know, I used to watch them and say, we want it like this and we want it like that. And then raggedy old book they were looking at to get the pictures, which was um, written by old Crumpy, who I knew quite well. Uh, that picture there is all a substructure and you can see the exhaust coming out the side and running down the gap which they've conveniently left in the chassis for us. That's the body of it, just rare body. And then it's got these um, little outlets at the back which obviously let the air out because in the original car all the dry sump, tank, petrol tank, that and the Dion axle was all in the back there. So, that, so they didn't do nothing. We made some ducks, or the boys at um, Southscope made some ducks to run the air from underneath the wheel arch to make it look like they did something. And also, because stop the water running in. And the headlights, we, we uh, left so that they would have aluminium covers, and I had those done by Ellington White, something like that, George or somebody. Anyway, he did quite a lot of Lotus things for me. And we just made an aluminium panel up to fit and he made he moulded the lights. This picture here is a picture of us going down outside the premises. That's the first time it was driven. That bit of concrete there that it's on cost me a thousand quid, which seemed like a fortune at the time. This is a picture of the seats. What happened was, forty odd years ago, somebody gave me a pair of seats out of a speedster Porsche, and I put one in my mini. When I sold the Mini, I left the seat in it, so I only had one. So it was ideal for the job. So what we did was we just made another one to match the original one. So as you can see there, the red one's the original one and the other one's the new one. That's a picture of the master cylinders. We, we, we did the pedals twice. One of our people who worked for us did the pedals. They weren't very good. Anyway, Tim did them completely again and made new pedals. This is the steering arm, so we had to alter the steering arms. As you can see, the one on the far left is just a welded up original steering arm, which was just to get everything in the right place. But the uh, the other steering arms are obviously machined from the solid. Um, and I think Laura did those, who still works for my son 20 odd years ago. So she was a young woman then. If you thought about nothing else really like the cars, you realise that the Italians have got a definite eye for making something look fabulous. And obviously I had the book to look at, but one of the things I noticed was this wheel arch. If you look at this wheel arch, it goes up and then it goes straight and then it goes round. And I made a real special point of copying the book exactly. Because when the car's finished, that wheel arch always makes it look like the car's going along and it's standing still. Because in England, we probably would have just made a circle like that. But that is a bit of Italian style there, and it really works, you know. And the whole car, you know, it's like these vents. There's vents on the side, and it's got a lovely big filler cap. You know, the whole thing, it, it's just a beautiful thing. And, and I really wanted one, and as it happened, I never actually had one. But Bill lets me drive it. My son did the Pomeroy Trophy in it. and. Um, it's a bloody good old car now, and because he's had it for donkey's years, and he drives it around London all the time. But it's only recently started to get trouble, and it's the puddling, so I'm convinced of it. But anyway, we'll do that. That's the seats I was on about, which have got that nice little sort of vent in the back to let the sweat out when you're doing the long distance Melia Melia races and what have you. Well, of course, this car never did that. Well, this little thing in here. <laughs> Like that. Well, the old boys at Southstone did all that. As you can see, it's a beautiful job. And even in there, it's got a rain cutter and it's got a, a tube that let, lets the rain out. And obviously, it would never have had a fuel gauge, so we hit the fuel gauge just there. So that works, and we made the petrol tank. And it's got these ducts in the back, which are not original, but it had these two holes. And I thought, well, you've got to do the same. So I made these ducks up. Well, when I say that, South Stoke made these ducks up. And, and of course it's got room in the boot, whereas the original car, this would have been full of petrol tank, the deal back axle, dry sump tank, wouldn't have been anything like this. But 
obviously as a road car, this is very useful. The spare wheel goes in there and you've got a little bit of room. But um, it's turned out, it's just got better and better over the years. I'm sorry about the clothes, but I went to shopping this morning and I was thinking about my haircut, but it didn't happen. It was too crowded. Anyway, Josh is going on holiday for a week. And this was all arranged months ago, so there's no surprise, not like the last time. But we thought, well, before he goes on holiday, we ought to stick something on, because we were doing this video about a Maserati, and the idea was to drive it and test it out the road, but we didn't get it finished. So I've talked him into putting this video on, half done really, because it's quite interesting and you can see, you know, you'll see the video. But it's got to be questions that people want to ask, you know, so we thought, well, before we road test it, when Josh comes back on holiday, you'll have an opportunity to write in and say, how did you do that bit then? And what happened there? And, you know, and we can answer your questions the next time when we drive the car up the road which is what we intend to do. But anyway, shed racing is coming on because obviously we did the three hour race in the MGB and Josh's um, MGZR has not been touched yet, but we game, we did a test day with that and we did a few jobs on it and we got it to handle a little bit better, but we're really deciding what we're gonna have to do when we do the big job. But as you can see, he's sort of like an apprentice racing driver, really. So I thought, well, we've got to give him a bit of a challenge because, you know, well, no driving an MPB is not easy when you're going to, in the pouring rain, etc. I thought we'd give him a real challenge. And to be honest, I'm a bit like the dad who buys toys for the boy because he wants to play with them himself. So what's happened is we've bought a Janetta. And my son was in partnerships with old um, Duncan Pittaway, you know, the bloke who owns that beast to chew in. And they bought this car about five or ten years ago and they were going to do big things. They did a couple of races in it but I think the vintage took over from the modern. So anyway it's a Janetta G50. It's probably out of date now but it doesn't make any difference. It's still got 350 horsepower. And so I thought even if we never race it we could go testing with it. We could go and do a track day with it and we can see how good Josh really is in something that's very fast. So anyway, so that's something to look forward to, because when Josh gets back on holiday, old Duncan's going to deliver the G50. So that would be another thing. We'll have to get it together, because obviously they took it to pieces, because we never buy cars that are together. The MGB is about the only car I've ever bought and didn't drive in boxes. Right, so this is your chance to ask the questions, because we're... You know, and I've been through the car fairly carefully, there's bound to be things you think, well, how did they do that, or why did they do that? So now's your chance to answer, and don't forget to subscribe.